Welcome to Free Thought Matters, a production of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. Annie Laurie and I are the executive directors of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. We are a state church watchdog with more than 31,000 non-religious members nationwide. You can ask for a free copy of our newspaper. It's called Free Thought Today. Or you can just join us at FFRF.org. And we're delighted that our guest today is Daniel C. Dennett, the Austin B. Fletcher Professor of Philosophy at Tufts University. Daniel Dennett is author of many best-selling books in the field of philosophy and science, including Consciousness Explained, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, Intuition Pumps, and Breaking the Spell, Religion as a Natural Phenomenon. And Daniel Dennett also co-authored the book, Caught in the Pulpit, Leaving Belief Behind, with Linda Lascola. It's about clergy who lose their religion. And his newest book is called From Bacteria to Bach and Back. That's a cute title. The Evolution of Minds. And we're especially honored that Daniel C. Dennett is an honorary director of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And he's been a recipient of FFRF's Emperor Has No Clothes <clears throat> Award, reserved for public figures who make known their descent from religion. So, Dan Dennett, thanks for being a guest on Free Thought Matters. I'm delighted to be here, Dan and Annie Laurie. Great to see you again. Yes, now as an academic, um, you're very brave in coming out of the closet as a public non-believer. Um, what prompted you to do that? Actually, as an academic, I don't think it takes much courage at all. I, I do have some sympathy for the uh, people who have said, uh, if you're at, a, at a, an elite university and you are actually a believer, uh, it takes courage to, to acknowledge that, to, to say you go to church every Sunday. So, so it, doesn't take, it, it doesn't take courage, I think, for an academic to come out as an atheist. Once you have tenure, right? No. Um, Even then? Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 that doesn't make any difference at all on this point, I think. In fact, um, uh, uh, I'll put the cat among the pigeons here. Huh. I would think that an assistant professor bucking for tenure, if that person was religious, would probably try to keep that under the rugs. Wow, okay. But you've written that um, <coughs> many people try to keep an academic, uh, I mean a, dipl a diplomatic silence oh, about yeah. being non-believers. And, and it was the ominous rise of sort of theocratic rumblings during the, the Bush years uh, that got me and a lot of other people thinking, well, well, wait a minute, maybe our diplomatic buttoning of our lips about this is, is not appropriate. Maybe we should just make it, as a matter of fact, make it widely known, not, not in a great challenging way. We say, yeah, of course, I'm an atheist, aren't you? Yeah. Um, and uh, then wanted to do more than that. Well, you wrote a New York Times op-ed, for right. example. I, I did a, a New York Times op-ed piece, which was, I think, the, the most shared piece of the month from the New York mm. Times that month uh, about the Brights movement and, uh, and about uh, the importance of atheists and free thinkers just, just to let it be known. It's, it's an obvious thing to let people know about, and you don't have to buttonhole them, you don't have to cajole them in any special way. Because the, I think the one thing I learned just before I wrote that op-ed was really the inspiration for this, was I gave a talk to a group of high, very smart high school kids out in Seattle. They'd been drawn from all over the country. They were, they were sort of leaders in their, in their high schools. And they have a whole lot of novelists and scientists and people like me giving very short talks about our lives and our work. And I just, on the spur of the moment, thinking, I'm gonna do this. So I just said when I got up, oh, by the way, I'm a bright, and I said what a bright was. Which and is? A bright is a, is, a, is a free thinker, is an atheist, somebody who doesn't believe in a supernatural uh, uh, being of any sort. And the question was, what kind of a reaction was it going to get? To the astonishment, I think, of a lot of the other people there, 
the students, large numbers of them, were thrilled. They had never heard an adult mm -hmm. say that in mm -hmm. public. And the amusing, delightful effect was after I spoke, I was one of the first speakers, <clears throat> three or four of the, of the other speakers and these were Nobel laureates in science or novelists. Said, oh, by the way, I'm a bright too. Yeah, me too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah me too. I'm a bright too. Now it's okay to say it's it. It's okay to say it. And cheers <laughs> would go up. Uh, well, look, this is important. Just letting people know that they're not alone. Because these, these kids, these were smart high school kids. So these were not particularly sheltered kids. But they were, a lot of them were just absolutely thrilled to discover hmm. that they were not alone. Well, let's let's just spread that word. Well, you are a bright guy. I mean, just your intelligence. <laughs> I read somewhere that when you were 11 years old, somebody heard you talk and said, you are a philosopher. From that early age, you've been thinking about philosophy. Were you also a non-believer from an early age? Were you like um, I can't remember exactly how things went. Uh, my family gave me a standard uh, suburban liberal Protestant, you know, United Church of Christ, yeah. um, Sunday school education, which I'm very happy about. I'm glad I have it. I, I, I can recite a lot of Bible verses and I know all the hymns. I've mm. sung in a lot of choirs. Um, uh, but it never was played a very big part in my life except my social life, you know, in junior high school and high school, very important yeah. to be a member of fellowship. That's where all the best dances were. Huh. And, uh, but then when I was a teenager, um, actually I was confirmed in the church. Come to think of well, it. then you're covered, so there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but then I, I, I just discovered that, oh, no, this is, give me a break. This is crazy. <laughs> it, it was not hard for me to uh, do a complete abandonment of religion. Well, but but it, I think, in fact, I... I have real affection for many of the rituals and the music and the art and the and the verses of the Bible, uh, affection, but not credence. Yeah. yeah. Now you've been called one of the four horsemen of yeah. the new atheism. Yeah. But is this really a new atheism? No. It's, well, I don't know who invented it. We didn't. Some people <laughs> think we named ourselves. No, I don't know who came up with that moniker. We you had the, and Dawkins and Hitchens and, and, Hitchens and Sam Hitchens Harris. Hitchens and Sam Harris. Yeah. We had a meeting in Hitch's apartment in, New, in Washington, D.C., and it was videotaped, and that's not, it's now out as a book, by the way, which you can find in your local oh, really? bookstore. Oh, yeah, with uh, follow-up pieces by Richard and Sam and me, uh, uh, and uh, 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 not, not from Hitch, alas, since he, yes. he died. Uh, but that's just out, just in the last few weeks. Now, you were called that in part because you wrote a book called Breaking, Breaking the, the Spell. spell. Yeah. So what is this spell, and how do we break it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I've been a bit of a gadfly in my career, but this is the one time where I get to be the white sheep. Huh. I, get, I get to be the good cop, um, because my book is the mildest uh, of, the, of the books, that, uh, of the Four Horsemen. I set out to write a book applying my research on cultural evolution and biology to a naturalistic account of religion. I said, look, religion is a natural phenomenon. Here it is. A lot of people think it's a supernatural phenomenon. They're wrong. But that doesn't mean we don't have to explain it. We do. It's a deeply interesting set of phenomena. And there's got to be an explanation that makes explains why it exists, why it has the features that now, it has. Now, we have three minutes before the break. Can you explain that in three minutes? Yeah, I, I can. I can do better than that. Um, so the spell I wanted to break was the spell which says, don't do that. Hands off. Do not approach religion with scientific objectivity and scrutiny. You always have to approach religion sort of on your knees and with an attitude of great reverence. I said, no, we, I want to treat religion the same way I would treat the oil industry or climate change or, or the banking system. This is a phenomenon. Let's take off the gloves. Let's study it. Let's find out. Let's not settle for half-truths. Let's really look at it. That's the spell I wanted to break. Now, a lot of people thought, if you break that spell, you'll break the other spell. 
uh, mm -hmm. the enchantment of religion itself. And I thought, well, you know, that's, an op that's a chance, but that, that's not the point of the book. Mm -hmm. And if religion is worth believing in, then it'll come through this just with flying colors. Um, a, a, a set of beliefs that can't withstand rational scrutiny does not deserve to be perpetuated. That's right. And you also uh, attack morality and religion as well. Do we need religion to be moral? I think that was the yeah. thesis of Darwin's dangerous idea. What was Darwin's <coughs> dangerous idea? Well, Darwin's dangerous idea was just the wonderful, strange inversion of reasoning, as uh, one of his critics said, that, that you don't need intelligence to explain all the fantastic design of the biosphere, all the wonderful articulation of parts of nature, uh, uh, a, a mindless, purposeless, mechanistic process can explain all of this. That was his dangerous idea. It's proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. It pulls the rug out of the only impressive argument that there's ever been for the existence of God, and that's the design argument. And so it still gives people a lot of trouble. It certainly does. Yeah. We're talking about evolution. <laughs> That's right. Cre uh, creationism is rocked back on its heels now, but uh, a lot of people f still hanker that some version, there must be some version of that that's true. They're wrong, but, but they don't give up. When you came into our building a few minutes ago, you got to meet Charles Darwin. Yes. A, face, a statue, a lifelike statue. <laughs> wonderful. Of wonderful, yeah. Silicon. So his ideas live on, and uh, one, of the, one of the greatest turning points, I think, in intellectual history was his idea of natural selection. We have to take a break here. Uh, we're talking with author and philosopher Daniel C. Dennett. And after the break, we'll discuss some more about why the spell of religion should be broken. I'm Dan Barker. I'm Annie Laurie Gala. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Gabrielle Hinahara, um, and I'm an atheist because I believe in the power of doing good for the sake of doing good, and not because some divine entity tells you what is good and what's not, um, and not because you think it will get you into some sort of heavenly afterlife. Uh, I believe in human morality, um, which is why I think that most cultures across the world have come to the kind of same basic principles and values, such as the golden rule, which isn't based in religion, but is based in human interactions um, and mutual respect. And I think a lot of people turn to religion because it makes the choice of morality really easy, black and white, right and wrong, and you don't have to decide which is which. And in my experience as being an atheist through my life, I have found that uh, moral choices are something that I think about a lot more than a lot of other people because nobody's telling me the answer. Um, and since I don't believe in an afterlife, pretty much my whole meaning in life is based on my interactions with other people and that I can leave this world a better place by my actions. And welcome back to Free Thought Matters. I'm Dan Barker. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And we're continuing our conversation with philosopher and author, and I understand a sailor as well. Yes, I wish I could sail more. Arthritis is getting the better of me now, but yes, yeah. lifelong sailor. Daniel C. Dennett. So we've talked about a lot of your books. You've had so many books. When I go into the bookstore under philosophy or that, there's a lot of books that you have written. There's also books about you that are written, which actually raises you to a different level. People <laughs> are writing books about you and yeah. your books. But uh, uh, one that I was really impressed with uh, came out uh, some years ago, uh, Consciousness explain. And as a philosopher, you know that consciousness and free will, those are big, arguable topics. Uh, is consciousness explained? Um, 
that was a brave title, and I think in a sense I did explain consciousness, and the theory's holding up well, because it was not just a philosophical theory, it was a scientific theory. And it's getting more and more detail. I'm happy to say that the outlines that I sketched out back in 91 are being filled out very nicely, thank yeah. you. And I'm, that's my main project. So you're a secular days. prophet. <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a would-be scientist. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm somebody who is trying to help the scientists put together a proper scientifically grounded theory of consciousness. And right now, uh, we're feeling pretty confident about One the of the phrases I love in your book, which I use a lot in some of my debates in that, is that you, you describe consciousness as the center of narrative gravity. What do you mean by that? Um, Tradition, religious tradition, has it that we have a soul, and that the soul is a sort of immortal, magical, wonderful thing. And where is it? Well, maybe it's in the middle of your head. Who knows? Or it's in your heart, somewhere in your body. And it's it's the it's the it's the it's the homunculus that makes your body move. That's a forlorn idea, but it sure seems as if each of us has a sort of center. It's it's what we call I. We say I have a body. What, does that mean the same as this body owns itself? Hmm. No. So we seem to have this special role for the first person pronoun, and what does this I, this ego, what is it? What is a self? And it, well, what it is, is it's an abstraction. It's like the concept of a center of gravity. The center of gravity of this cup is something that is perfectly uh, well-defined entity, but it's not made of anything. It's not an atom of anything. It's, and it, it's, it's actually not in the cup at all. In it's, fact, in the case of the cup, it's in the space it's in, in the, the middle of there. The... Yeah. So a center of gravity is a nice abstraction, very useful, and you can almost see them and feel them. You know, sit down, you're rocking the boat. It's a very tangible, which is sort of comical, it's a tangible abstract object. It's not really tangible. Well, the center of narrative gravity is the same sort of thing. It's it's the spokesperson, it's the storyteller who tells the story of your life. And we do it semi-consciously, unconsciously, deliberately. Sometimes we lie, sometimes we tell the truth. But all of our verbalizations, all of our narratives and explanations and justifications are anchored in this logical subject, I. Mm -hmm. Did you do that? Oh, no. <laughs> no, uh, somebody else did it. Mm -hmm. Or somebody recently wrote a book called My Brain Made Me Do It. <laughs> uh, well, what yeah. else would you want to make <laughs> you do it? <laughs> it's not as if, but the sentence nicely reveals a sort of confusion that people have. Well, if my brain made me do it, I guess I didn't do it. What, and, aren't you your brain? <laughs> and that center shifts depending on the narratives that are happening in your brain. There's not like one actual place depending. No, right. It's, it's not, it's unlike the center of gravity. It's, it's, it's not a sort of mathematical point in three space. Hmm. It, it's not as if it's right where the pineal gland is or just south of the hippocampus. Huh. Uh, it's, an, it's more abstract than that. Huh. It's more like the average taxpayer or something. It's not anywhere. <laughs> so that phrase that you use, center of narrative gravity, is itself an intuition pump. And you wrote a whole book about yeah, yeah. intuition pumps, which is a way that many authors and philosophers use analogies or other types Thought of Thought experiments. Tricks to yeah, yeah. Uh, intuition pumps are, are tools for thinking. And they work by, uh, you, you introduce them to somebody and you get their head thinking that way, and you create a little virtual machine in their head, and it pumps an intuition. They say, oh, yeah, now I get it. Yeah. Well, what's and an sometimes, example? sometimes they're formal arguments, and sometimes they're just tricks. And some of them are good, and some of them are bad. And a lot of them are analogies that you yeah. use to re represent one thing with another. So yeah. give us uh, some examples. Plato's cave. Oh. Um, uh, uh, the original position in John Rawls' uh, theory of justice, uh -huh. uh, Descartes' evil demon hypothesis. Uh, uh -huh. Those are classic philosophical intuition problems. There have been hundreds since then. And then there's very, very simple ones that I, 
love to include. One of my favorites is is the Shirley alarm. The what? The Shirley alarm. Uh, Shirley. Shirley. S U R E L E. L Y. And what I what I tell my students, I say, every time you see the word Shirley in a text, a little bell should ring, ding, hmm. because Shirley is very often the sign. This is the weakest point yeah. in a person's argument. Why is that so? Because if it went without saying, they wouldn't say it. So they have to say it, but they don't want to defend it. So they go nudge, <laughs> nudge, surely. So surely you can't question religion. Yeah, yeah surely. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I actually did a little field work to check. I use a spell, uh, you know, a spell checker, a, a, a search engine, to look at oh, 50 philosophical texts for the word surely. Found a whole bunch of cases, and in well over half the cases, the surely was. That's right. This is this is this is like a like a sore spot. He says this is where this is where the author isn't isn't doesn't have the cards. Uh, this is a bluff. It's like saying we don't really have to think about this because your audience, you know this. It yeah, happens yeah. in some of my debates. They they yeah, say, yeah. well, that's just absurd. Yeah. Without explaining why, they just use yeah. that word. Yeah. yeah. And then so so we can stop talking about yeah, it. No, another n nice little intuition pump is. When you're asked a rhetorical question, think about just answering it. <laughs> a rhetorical question. Yeah, yeah right. Somebody says, well, well, who's to judge which religion is right? I will. <laughs> now, speaking of judging religion, Dan, you have branched off into something very different in becoming a supporter of ministers caught in the pulpit who yeah. are examining, re-examining their faith. Yeah. And you've done an immense amount of work on it and co-written a book about it. Yeah, well, L Linda Lascola did, did 90% of the work. And we had her on our show Yeah, recently, I gathered. On yes, this I show. remember this, yes. Yeah. So Linda approached me with the idea that we could find not just lay people, which I had found, who were deeply religious but confessed in private to me that they didn't actually believe any of that stuff. That's not why they were making the church the center of their life. And she said, I bet there's preachers out there by the dozens that are in the same boat. And thanks to you, Dan, you helped us get started by uh, uh, leading a few people into our uh, uh, study. And then our first study of half a dozen people, we treated them with such insight, or Linda did really, with such insight and sympathy that we were inundated after we published the first small study with uh, volunteers. Mm -hmm. You've heard six stories, wait till you hear mine. So we got another grant, this was research funded at Tufts, to go out and do more deeply confidential, absolutely secure interviews. And Linda was in effect, she was like a father confessor huh. for these people and it was heart breaking and moving because for many of them, they had never talked to anybody in the world, mm -hmm. not to their spouses, not to their children, not heavens, no, not to their superiors. Uh, and they were pouring out their hearts about the predicament they were in. So we wrote that up as a book. Caught in the pulpit. Caught in the pulpit. And then uh, my wife said, you know, this would make a great play. and. Uh, I can't remember the, what the order in which things happened, but uh, Mike Gazzana, a famous neuroscientist, friend of mine out in California in Santa Barbara, his daughter is a playwright in New York. <laughs> she got a hold of the book, and she fell in love with it, and she's written the play, and it's got a new title now. What is it? Adam Mann, parenthesis, <laughs> not his real name. <laughs> and we know Adam Mann. Very yes, well. you do. Uh, and so um, Adam Mann was one of our hmm. first uh, interviewees. He's delighted that we're, we're uh, naming the play after him. He's one of the main characters. You have in to the pay play. him a nickel now for every performance. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> we should. Using his yeah. name. Yes. If it ever makes it, if if it ever makes any money, and we're hoping, we're we're going to try to get it yeah. off Broadway within the calendar year. It may take a little longer than that, but uh, yes, we'd like it to sweep the country. And your research was part of the genesis, if I can use that word, part of the genesis <laughs> of. The Clergy Project, which yep. today has more than 900 
clergy, some of mm -hmm. them still active, who have abandoned their faith yeah. in the supernatural. Yeah, but they can't abandon the pulpit, many of them, some or of them. they haven't yet. And who knows how many thousands more are out there. Yeah. Um, I, I have, a, I have a, a suspicion about this. If, if you know uh, uh, a, a clergy person who's deeply involved in pastoral care and, and uh, uh, outreach and really, really pouring it on, doing a wonderful job in the community, very likely that's yeah. a person who is, whose actual religious belief has lapsed. Uh, the ones who still believe are out playing golf. I'm going to say that there are about a half million, surely, a half surely. million of them out there who have lost their faith. Well, well thank we're out you of time. So much. How, how many how many preachers are out there? I don't know, but it's, yeah. I, I think you're right. Thank you so much, Daniel Dennett, for joining us today and for everything you've done to help break the spell. Well, thank you, and thank you for all the work you've done, especially helping us get the clergy project and the. Uh, interviews off the ground. And, and thank you for joining Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters. I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.